Mysterious letters, a squirrel in a box, who really found Shirley Newman's body? Here's every time the thing about Pam did and didn't lie to you. Spoilers ahead. The thing about Pam's first episode sets a peaceful stage for an atrocious crime. We settle into the lull of post-Christmas small-town America, yet dreadful anticipation fills the air as narrator Keith Morrison assures us all hell will soon break loose. Moments later, we're dropped headlong into chaos with a corpse on the floor and a distraught husband on the phone with 911. We hear Russ Faria's pinched voice and see his half-closed eyes. It's his wife face down and motionless on the living room floor, her upper half splotched with dark blood. But that call didn't play out exactly like that. Faria V. McCarrick puts this 911 phone call at 9.40 p.m., making for a significant time gap in Russ Faria's activities at night. But reality fills in the gap. Russ Faria drove for a half hour to reach home and described walking into the house and finding his wife on the floor in the dark. Calling 911 wasn't his first instinct. St. Louis Magazine reports he knelt by her, assuming she'd gotten sick. The book Bone Deep, untangling the twisted true story of the tragic Betsy Faria murder case, notes Faria nearly embraced her before stopping short, afraid to mess up the scene for investigators. From the salacious opening, we get some backstory. It begins with Russ and Betsy Faria together at her mom Janet Meyer's house with their daughter Mariah, when Pam Hupp's phone call shatters their familial bliss. Hupp insists on picking Betsy Faria up from her mom's house, but Betsy Faria replies she's feeling better and stronger than usual and wants to stay with her family. Although we can only guess at the phone conversations Betsy Faria had that day, text messages paint a different picture than the show. So does Russ Faria's later testimony. According to St. Louis Magazine, Russ Faria didn't visit his mother-in-law's house. Instead, Deadline reported that he worked from home at his job as an IT specialist until 5 p.m., texting his wife throughout the day. At noon, he mentioned getting her after game night, and she agreed. But post-treatment, she changed her mind, texting at 3.46 p.m. that Pam Hupp would bring her home. She mentioned a low white cell blood count and inability to sleep at her mom's house. Documents obtained by Dateline back this up, showing Hupp tracked Betsy Faria's movements in the days leading up to December 27th, looking for a window when she'd be feeling frail from the chemotherapy and be alone, per NBC News. Bending the truth continues in the first episode of The Thing About Pam. The show flashes to Russ Faria and his friends absorbed in a role-playing game while taking monster hits off a of bong. While they did get a little high that night, the game never happened. That's because, as St. Louis Magazine reported, one of the five regular members of the crew couldn't make it, which took Rollmaster off the table. Instead, they watched the newest Conan the Barbarian movie. After that, they started the screen adaptation of Cormac McCarthy's The Road, but stopped halfway through, bored by the post-apocalyptic drama according to the book Bone Deep. Russ Faria recalled leaving his friend's house around 9 p.m. along with two other friends. He swung by Arby's in Lake St. Louis for two beef and cheddar melts, downing them while heading home. Fortunately, he threw the time-stamped Arby's receipt to the floor of his car. This receipt, as shown in the TV series, played a vital role later in corroborating his whereabouts on the night of his wife's murder, per Faria v. McCarrick, Merkel, Harney, and Askey. The 911 call Russ Faria made proved one of the most scrutinized pieces of evidence made during the first and second Betsy Faria murder trials. While the first episode of The Thing About Pam offers the highlights, it's a small slice of what really happened on the phone that night, per Bone D. The actual call contained unbridled panic, uncontrolled disbelief, and incoherent grief. Russ Faria's brain settled on an unlikely explanation that would come back to haunt him, saying as he did in the show, My wife killed herself. She's... she's... she's on the floor. The thing about Pam only airs portions of the 911 call, capturing the visceral horror of that night at 1.30 Sumac. But the real-life call stretched for 10 agonizing minutes before Chris Hollinsworth, a Lincoln County Sheriff's Office deputy, arrived. Once Hollingsworth saw the body, he ushered Russ Faria outside to avoid contaminating the crime scene. The flashback to Russ Faria's arrival at the house in the first episode contains another inaccuracy. Approaching the porch, Faria finds his dog, Sicily, and asks why she's out there. This isn't the dog's first sighting on the show. Prior to Faria getting home, we see Pam Hupp sitting in her car, leaving a voicemail on Betsy Faria's phone. Outside, Sicily stands in the road, barking at her. <laughs> While Sicily's whereabouts might not seem like a big deal, they factored into both the first and second murder trials. As Bone Deep recounts, Russ Faria never encountered Sicily on the porch. Instead, someone had chained her in the backyard, according to Faria v. McCarrick. Faria found this unusual, explaining that Sicily only went out for brief bathroom breaks at night. Fox 2 Now reports detectives claim they found a bloody paw print on Betsy Faria's body, which the prosecution used to assert the dog knew the murderer well. But during the retrial, a CSI agent testified the dog's coat and paws contained no presence of blood, throwing the alleged bloody paw print into suspicion. 
Midway through episode one of The Thing About Pam, Lincoln County law enforcement and first responders descend on 130 Sumac, turning the Faria's once quiet neighborhood into a spectacle. They include Detective Michael Merkel, Captain Mike Lang, and Lead Detective Ryan McCarrick. As they collect evidence, it's already clear they have a bias about who perpetrated the crime, but the show lies here, too. According to Bone Deep, Deputy Chris Hollinsworth showed up solo at the house on December 27th. He let himself inside while Russ Faria remained on the phone with the 911 dispatcher. One look at Betsy Faria's body told Hollingsworth he'd walked into a crime scene. He had Faria step outside and sit in a chair on the porch. Next, Hollingsworth got to work, calling for backup. Soon, detectives Patrick Harney and Mike Merkel arrived, scouring the living room for vital clues. As first responders continued to work the crime scene, Merkel and Harney turned their attention to the most likely suspect. They asked Faria to accompany them to the sheriff's office for a statement. One of the largest omissions in the first episode involves a conversation between Deputy Chris Hollingsworth and Russ Faria while both warmed up in his cruiser. According to St. Louis Magazine, Hollingsworth tried to simultaneously calm and distract Faria by asking random questions about the neighborhood, and it worked too well. Faria transformed from a near-hysterical widower into a chatty conversationalist, which struck Hollingsworth as strangely dissonant, even jarring behavior. Ultimately, the interaction had no impact when it came to cracking Betsy Faria's murder case. However, it might have been a suspenseful edge-of-your-seat moment for those unfamiliar with the case's facts. Artistic license aside, Faria B. McCarrick tells us Hollingsworth drove Faria to the sheriff's office around 11 p.m. that cold December night. It never dawned on Faria that he was the primary suspect. Back at the Lincoln County Sheriff's Office, Russ Faria's behavior fluctuated wildly, according to St. Louis Magazine. One moment, he calmly answered questions. The next, he melted into near hysterics, which law enforcement noted as over the top. He also did a lot of praying as detectives watched him kneel, building their case against him. Whether too calm or too agitated, confirmation bias worked against him. Episode 1 of The Thing About Pam attempts to capture the essence of Faria's tumultuous interrogation. Of course, time limitations mean it occurs over tense minutes rather than exhaustive hours. According to Faria v. McCarrick, Merkel, Harney, and Askey, after Faria went willingly with officers on December 27th, they didn't release him until December 29th, 2011 at 4.30 p.m., nearly two days after bringing him in, according to Dateline. St. Louis Magazine tells us he endured 10 hours of questioning, suffering severe sleep deprivation. Pam Hupp's interrogation in Episode 1 leaves out some pretty telltale dialogue, including the moment sheriff's deputies asked Hupp about Betsy Faria's $150,000 life insurance policy. She'd conveniently been named the sole beneficiary just four days before the murder, per Faria B. McCarrick. She goes, well, I want to change my beneficiary to you. Well, I want my kids to have it. I don't want Russ to have it. Despite the redacted questioning session, the show does an excellent job of depicting how Pam Huff disarmed law enforcement with her homey Midwestern persona. It also lays the groundwork for the infuriating inconsistencies that would characterize Huff's stories during the first and second Betsy Faria murder trials. This allowed Hupp to weave a web of deception implicating Russ Faria and his wife's murder. The tension ratchets up in Episode 2 of The Thing About Pam as Lincoln County law enforcement's trap snaps shut on Russ Faria. Investigators ignore his rock-solid alibi, instead believing Pam Hupp, a woman with no alibi and a compelling motive. We also see more of Mark Hupp, a mild, disinterested, even-tempered man. He takes his wife at face value without question. St. Louis Magazine reports law enforcement came to cross-check Pam Hupp's testimony from the day before against her husband's. But then the unthinkable happened. They let her be there during this interview. We see this in the show as she offers investigators sugar cookies and small talk, instantly putting them at ease. As the detectives nosh away, she gossips about the Farias like a stereotypical church lady, painting her alleged best friend's husband as maniacal. Horrifyingly, this is an accurate representation of what happened. But the most outlandish story that Pam Hupp told that day didn't make the television series. It involved a workout session that Pam Hupp accompanied Betsy Faria to. Hupp claimed Russ Faria had given his wife cloudy Gatorade that smelled rancid and tasted so awful Betsy Faria had to spit it out. By Hupp's account, this was just another way Russ would constantly degrade his wife. Another crucial event explored in Episode 2 of The Thing About Pam is the lie detector test that the Lincoln County Sheriff's Department claimed Russ Faria failed. We hear from Faria's defense attorney Joel Schwartz requesting the lie detector test results, but the series doesn't delve very deeply into this troubling part of the real-life case. As Joel Schwartz pointed out in an interview with St. Louis Magazine, Faria took the test without hesitation after 32 hours without sleep. What's more, he still had marijuana in his system. These two factors raised alarming red flags in Schwartz's mind. When Schwartz requested a video recording of the test, the sheriff's office claimed the camera hadn't worked. He couldn't get his hands on the raw data either. Instead, authorities gave him the following statement. There were significant, consistent physiological responses indicative of deception. 
Besides remaining mom on the folk test theory, we never hear much about the juicy details surrounding Pam Hupp's refusal to take a polygraph test per bustle. As always, Hupp had an excuse. She claimed she couldn't take one due to memory issues and an unconfirmed disability. Any logical person would have agreed these excuses looked highly suspect. In the second episode of The Thing About Pam, Joel Schwartz asks his client about Pam Hopp, and Russ Faria doesn't have a whole lot to say about her. She's… I don't know… nice lady. But according to St. Louis Magazine, his assessment of Hupp didn't stop there. He noted that his wife's so-called friend wasn't as close to Hupp as she claimed, saying, I could name half a dozen other people Betsy was closer to. The last text session Faria had with his wife supports this conclusion. Betsy Faria refers to her friend as Pam Hupp. The use of a last name depicts them more like acquaintances than inseparable friends. In a roundabout way, the television series alludes to this, especially in the first episode. Hupp imposes herself on the situation, showing up uninvited at Janet Meyer's home. Everybody at the house looks visibly uncomfortable. During Hupp's later interviews with detectives, we see her altering history to make her relationship with Betsy Faria sound more significant than it likely was. The creators of The Thing About Pam took liberties with characterizing Betsy Faria's two daughters. The oldest daughter, Leah Day, immediately buys the idea her stepdad could murder their mother. Maria Day appears far more sympathetic toward Russ. But in reality, the Faria daughters had more nuanced relationships with their longtime stepdad, per Fox 2 Now. A Fox 2 Now interview with both women a decade after their mother's murder provides insight into what really happened. The girls pointed out that Hupp went to great lengths to pick up their mom that evening, but authorities countered, saying Russ Faria was the, quote, only possible killer. During the interview, the days also discussed receiving a hurtful handwritten letter at the restaurant where they worked. Although anonymous, they wrongly assumed it came from their stepdad, creating a huge rift at the time. And it made it seem like it was from someone affiliated with Russ. Looking back now, I'm sure it was sent from Pam Hub. We never heard about the letter during episode 3 of The Thing About Pam, but we do see a half-truth involving prosecutor Leah Askey who pressures Maria Day to testify against Russ Faria. In reality, Leah Day had this conversation with Askey. Episode 3 ends with a bang. An unmarked box sits in the driveway of Pam Hupp's elderly next-door neighbor, Minnie, a busybody who keeps her eye on the community. Earlier, we watch Hupp con Minnie into attending Russ Faria's first murder trial while Hupp waits to testify with the other witnesses. Minnie wears a disguise and keeps Hupp appraised of the court's goings-on via text message. But their relationship sours after Hupp learns Minnie's been talking to Dateline about the Russ Faria murder trial. Fast forward back to the shoebox, which Minnie opens, finding one of the beloved neighborhood squirrels she feeds. That sort of sly aggression fits with accounts from Hupp's friends, per St. Louis Magazine. One individual observed, she was easy company. I never saw her get mad. Members of Hupp's neighborhood and O'Fallon likely would have agreed. But if these neighbors thought about it, they could attest to strange circumstances that started when the Hupps moved in. Cars got keyed, mean-spirited letters showed up, and bloody animal remains ended up in one neighbor's yard. Hindsight now makes them wonder if such incidents stem back to Hupp. Episode 4 of The Thing About Pam does a deep dive into Pam Hupp's inglorious past. Portrayed as having deep-seated feelings of repression and resentment, she lashes out at her conservative Catholic and alcoholic mother, Shirley Newman. In return, Newman threatens repeatedly to cut her out of her will. The show alludes to Hupp's pent-up rage after getting knocked up at prom, enduring a shotgun wedding, and resigning herself to housewife status. St. Louis Magazine confirms some elements of the storyline. Hupp's friends also recall sensing underlying resentment from her. Although she'd done the responsible thing, changing dirty diapers and warming bottles held little glamour compared to going off to college. But not much has been written about Hupp and Newman's relationship, other than the fact it's been suspected of ending in matricide. As a beneficiary of her mother's life insurance policy, Hupp had a clear motive. And the way Newman's body fell through the middle metal rungs of a balcony without damaging the top banister looked highly suspicious. But here's where the show goes off the rails. Newman died on Halloween, and the show depicts her body found at night by a pair of teen trick-or-treaters. While it makes for a dramatic moment, that's not how it went down. Fox 2 Now reports a housekeeper at Lakeview Park in Fenton, the facility where Newman lived, found her body at approximately 2.30 p.m. Hop has not been charged in her mother's death. She is due in court later this month in the other murder case. In the sixth episode of The Thing About Pam, Hupp goes after Russ Faria again through a harebrained plot posing as Kathy Singer of NBC's Dateline. She buys various items from the dollar store, including a knife, and then cruises the Sweet Gathering's mobile home park where Carol Alford lives. Hupp offers Alford $1,000 to record some sound bites for an upcoming episode of Dateline. As Hupp gave off increasingly weird vibes during the drive, Alford asked to go back for her shoes and to lock her front door, accurately portrayed in the show. But they omit the moment after Alfred's return when she told Hupp she had cameras on her house and a knife in her hoodie pocket. 
The show also suggests Pam set her sights on Louis Gumpenberger immediately after Alfred. In reality, Hupp did a lot more neighborhood trolling before setting her sights on the mentally disabled man, as reported by Fox 2. Cell phone tracking data shows six days after letting Alfred go, Hupp lured Gumpenberger from his apartment to her house. There, she shot him dead in her bedroom rather than the entryway, as the show depicts. As for the makeshift rug that protects her carpet from his blood, in reality, a missing doormat was found under his body, per St. Louis Today. I just started shooting and walking towards him because I, I wanted to be sure I hit him. Check out one of our newest videos right here! Plus, even more grunge videos about your favorite shows are coming soon. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and hit the bell so you don't miss a single one.